Hey Adam. So, does it feel like Groundhog Day again? It's like Groundhog Day. Every time I look up, here's Neil wandering into my office with a camera. Yeah. So, la last week we talked about, obviously, iSCSI. Uh -huh. I know we wanted to talk about sort of fault tolerance and clustering and that sort of stuff. So, okay. should, we, should we hit that? Sure. Let's do that. Let's so, do that. Uh, first of all, let's whiteboard and then let's go and, go and show okay. the demo. Sounds cool. good. All right, so I guess you know, there's a few different types of clustering or a few technologies we call clustering at Microsoft. You have high-performance computing and compute clusters for, for solving tough problems. Uh, Windows load balancing, which lets you kind of spread out a network load across a few machines. What we're going to talk about today is what we now call failover clustering, which is this idea of I've got an application that has to stay running. If the hardware that it's running on fails, I need another machine to pick up and, and just keep running with that same workload. Cool. Um, and when we do that with Microsoft, we use this idea of shared nothing, being the idea that the, uh, you know, the the data that's in use is only being accessed by one machine at a time. So when we build this kind of cluster, we have a few components. One is our storage. Uh, today we're going to use an iSCSI volume, but you need some kind of a storage you can get at from multiple machines, um, you know, SAN, SCSI, fiber optic, of some format. And for our cluster today, we're just going to have two servers. We support much larger you know, cluster groups here, and the idea that we we just have an app running on one. Uh, if it fails, this machine takes over, recognizes that this machine has gone down, takes over ownership of the drive that it was using, and uh, just picks up the load and keeps going. Um, so the other thing we have when you when you do a cluster on Microsoft, we actually have two disks that are part of the cluster. This one where our data is going to sit. And we have another disk. Um, we used to call it the quorum disk, now we call it the witness. And this disk has a couple of jobs. One of them is to hold all the configuration for the application. So if this is, um, you know, today we're going to be doing some stuff with Hyper-V. I'm going to show you how to fail over a virtual machine from one, one server to the other. All the configuration for that particular virtual machine, um, you, know, how, you know, what happens when it's clustered and things like that, all sit on this witness disk, which both machines can access so that uh, when this machine fails, this machine knows what the configuration needs to look like before it brings that one up. Uh, the other thing that we need is some kind of a, um, a heartbeat connection between these two machines just to make sure that, that it's up and that it's running. So that, that's how these machines figure out. Has he got ownership of it? Has he gone down? Do I need to take over ownership of the application? We do that over this heartbeat connection. Today we're going to do everything. We're doing our iSCSI and everything over a single over our same network. In real life, in enterprise production, you would never do that. Um, but as a way to, to sort of show you how it all works in the lab, we're going to do that. We'll have our heartbeat running on the same network um, that our regular traffic between these two machines goes through, which also happens to be the same traffic that our iSCSI connection uh, to the storage is going to be on. Um, but you'll see that, that when we run the, uh, the cluster configuration, it'll actually warn us, hey, you don't have any kind of redundant network links here. If your network link goes down, you're going to lose your heartbeat and everything else. Um, it'll still let us go ahead and, and install that way, but it does give us a warning that we have a single point of failure uh, in our configuration, which is our network. Uh, so what we'll do, as we, what you'll see me do, is we'll set up uh, these machines in a cluster. We'll set up Hyper-V in a virtual machine, uh, and then actually all that setup will, will happen for us through the, the magic of the wizards in Server 2008, so that these two machines um, you know, both know about and can both run that virtual machine and fail it back and forth between them. Uh, the, other, the other piece of configuration that we'll need to do here, um, you know, we'll provide a name for the cluster, and then we need to provide a new IP address. So each of these machines have their own IP address. But when remote users are connecting into our application, which in this case is our virtual machine, they need, um, for, for purposes of administering it, they need another IP address because the administration tools don't really know. Is it on this machine? Is it on this machine? So our cluster actually will get a, its own IP address as well and machine name. So think of that if, for example, we were clustering a website or we wanted to make a highly available website. Well, the website's got an IP address, but which machine actually is gonna, that going to be running on? Which machine gets that IP address? So that's another part of the cluster configuration is a, a virtual IP address that will one of these two machines will respond to, depending on which one owns the cluster. 
So that at kind of a high level is what it looks like. Let's go ahead and move over to the machines and uh, I'll show you what it actually looks like for real. Cool. Okay, so we're looking at the screen of one of the two machines that we're going to cluster. Now you can see they're right here on the desk, a couple of these little units. Um, we're already connected to our iSCSI storage. If I show up here, these two are uh, iSCSI disks that we're going to connect to. And uh, I've already installed, if we go down here to roles, I've already installed the Hyper-V role here. The other machine in the cluster, uh, I've already installed the failover clustering feature. I'll go ahead and do that now so you can see. I check that I'm installing failover clustering. Hit next. Hit install. Um, you know, this takes just a minute to install failover clustering. There's no reboot required. Once this finishes, I'm ready to join this machine into a cluster. Um, and when I do that, what you'll see, the first thing that happens is it wants to validate the cluster installation. This is a really key new feature in Server 2008 because it used to be anytime you built a cluster, um, you had to use all the components of the cluster had to be certified together as uh, cluster components. So you couldn't kind of just cherry pick which machine, which SCSI card, etc., that you wanted to use for your cluster. You had to have a whole cluster validated um, installation. Now with Server 2008, we actually run a validation wizard which will do that validation for me and make sure that I've got a, a valid cluster. Okay, this is succeeded, so now I will have a new uh, failover cluster management wizard, or failover management console. The first thing that I would do here is click uh, create a cluster. And as I mentioned, the first thing it's going to want to do is, is validate the cluster. I'll give it the name of the two uh, machines that I'm going to put in the cluster. Cluster 1 and Cluster 2. It takes just a minute. It finds that machine on the network. We're ready to continue. We're just going to do a two-node cluster. And there's a few resources that we need to give the cluster, one being the cluster name and the second being the IP address of the clustered machines. Remember, we're going to have services that fail over back and forth, so we can't use the static IP address of the machine because that IP address for the app, for the program we've clustered, you know, it's not always going to be on that machine. So we create a, a new IP address which will fail over back and forth with our uh, now. I'll just show you while this is running. It just takes a minute because we didn't run the validation step here, so I'm going to, but I ran that previously on the other machine in the cluster, so I'm going to switch over and just show you what the validation report looks like on a machine. Normally, first thing you do is validate your cluster, uh, and, and it runs a report where it just tries a bunch of things to see if the machine's actually supported in a cluster. Then it comes back with this report. And I'll just show you the report that I ran previously. Uh, you can see some of the things that it checks for to see what's available, what the operating systems are. And uh, I'll just point out a couple of the warnings that I got here. Notice I got a, a warning for my network communications. If I click on this, what it's actually telling me is there's only one network interface in these machines. So I've actually got a single point of failure uh, being my network card. So if the network goes down between these two machines, um, you know, my, it, it's a single point of failure. It's just giving me a warning. It still let me cluster. It's still a validated cluster. But um, you know, there's, there's potential there that, that my cluster will fail. Everything else on this report came out just fine. Um, you know, it does a bunch of things as part of the report. It actually looks for my disks, fails the disks back and forth from one machine in the cluster to the other, make sure those all recover properly.